Hello, everybody. Welcome to the MetroVision Idea Exchange, Doubled Up in the, and Dealing With It, Part 2. My name is Kevin Priestley, and I'm an assistant planner here at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog. I'm joined today by Jennifer Newcomer and Phyllis Resnick to discuss new research that they have conducted that investigates the prevalence and depth of the doubling up phenomenon in the Denver region and Colorado more broadly. I think we're going to have an excellent discussion today, and while we may not provide definitive answers to untangle this wicked problem, I hope you listen actively and help us develop research questions for SHIFT Research Lab and the Colorado Future Center to consider as they carry this project forward. Here's our agenda for today. I have a short set of announcements to run through and some background information about doubling up nationally to set the stage for our presenters. These announcements are available as PDFs in the handouts pane of your GoToWebinar panel. And after I get through my, uh, my little talk, I will turn it over to Jennifer and Phyllis. So moving on to announcements, Dr. Cog's way to go team is preparing for GoTober. GoTober is an employer-sponsored challenge to encourage employees to try new, fun, money-saving, and stress-reducing ways to commute to work while competing against other companies for glory and prizes. Company employees are challenged to commute in new ways, think walking, biking, riding transit, or carpooling, as many times as possible in October, and to track their trips online. Company registration is open now through September 6th. Applications are open for Dr. Cog's Fall 2019 Citizens Academy. Through the seven-week course, the Academy exposes participants to important regional issues like transportation, economic vitality, housing, civic engagement, and more. Each course includes weekly three-hour sessions consisting of lectures from local subject matter experts, small group interactions, and networking opportunities. In addition, participants develop individual action plans to put in place upon completing the Academy. Those interested in applying should do so by 5 p.m. on August 23rd. AARP, Dr. Cog, Lifelong Colorado, and Rose Community Foundation are looking to invest in creative projects that help older adults remain and thrive in their communities. We are looking to fund projects in two categories. One is a community or organization interested in completing a baseline assessment of age friendliness, including the development of a community-wide action plan based on the findings of the assessment, or the second category, a community or organization that previously completed an assessment of age friendliness that wants to implement an action or strategy identified during the assessment and planning phase. Eligible applicants include local governments within the seven county Denver metro area and community partners within these areas that work closely with local governments to develop or implement age friendly strategies. The maximum award is $5,000 per project and applications are due before 5 p.m. on Wednesday, August 30th. Contact Derek Webb at dweb.drcog.org for more information. With the generous support of APA Colorado, one AICP credit has been approved for attendees listening to this session live only. You can use the event number on the screen to log your credit on the American Planning Association website. Finally, uh, we will accept questions through the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. Please submit questions at any time during, during the event and I strongly encourage you to submit questions as they come to you to allow us to move seamlessly into the question and answer period. In addition, we will use GoToWebinar's polling features several times during the event today, mostly to tee off presentations, but also to offer you some time to reflect on your community and local government. To get used to it, um, we will start our first poll, which just simply asks where you're attending the webinar from today and um, we will give you uh, 20 seconds to answer that poll. Another five seconds.
So uh, unsurprisingly, most people are from the Denver region. However, it does look like there's a pretty good group from other, from other parts of the United States and so um, and even from outside the United States. So we hope that um, the conversation today um, can move, uh, can, can help you out wherever you're located. So with that, I will enter um, into, into my uh, setting the stage for our presenters today. So simply put, doubling up is when more than one household occupies the same housing unit. Um, HUD has a more technical definition, which you can see on the screen. Um, anecdotally, there are two incredibly common doubling up narratives in the United States. The first occurs when a person migrates to the United States to live with relatives or friends while they get their feet underneath them. My great grandfather, for example, immigrated from Ireland and moved in with family in Chicago before he eventually saved enough to move out, rent, and eventually buy the home where my grandfather was born. The second story has emerged uh, a little bit more recently. Think a young person who moves back in with their parents after graduating from college and before or as they're entering into the workforce. Typically, we consider doubling up to be a temporary condition where one relies on the goodwill of friends or family to earn income and save for a place of their own. Whether or not that's the case anymore might be up for debate as housing costs have gotten so high. To that point, doubling up represents a disguised form of stress in the nation's housing markets. This is truly one of those wicked planning problems, as I mentioned at the very top of the session today, in that it implicates varying and diverse parts of society. There are economic forces in play, especially wages and employment and housing production. There's public policy and law, especially things like land use and occupancy regulations. And although we won't talk about it as much, there are also things uh, in social structures like kinship and family formation that are all part of this conversation. Um, and though we won't focus too much on the kinship and family formation part of it, it is uh, an interesting part of the story nonetheless. So for some background on what we're looking at today, and uh, the, the, a good starting point is really the, the Great Recession. So between 1989 and 2007, uh, and this, research, this graph that you're seeing comes from some research conducted by the Census Bureau in 2012, between 1989 and 2007, change in doubled up households corresponded with change in total households. That should make some intuitive sense where if there's more households, it's likely that there will also be some more doubled up households. It's really, really with the recession where that uh, dynamic has changed a little bit. The Great Recession marked the first time in at least 20 years where the change in doubled up households accelerated <coughs> while overall household growth, thinking household formation, actually slowed. Part of the story that's uh, important here um, is home price is just home prices increasing uh, versus relative wage stagnation. So this slide shows the change in the nation's home price index in blue alongside median personal income in red. Both are indexed to inflation and both indexes are set at 100 at, at 2000. So that's why that line is, is there. Since that time, home price growth has exceeded, rel uh, has exceeded relatively flat income gains and homes have gotten more expensive while the average worker likely hasn't seen their income increase to a level where they can afford those growing housing prices. It's a big part of the story. Another part of the story is, uh, of, the cost of, in of the increase in cost of housing has been slowing rates of new housing production nationally. So this slide shows monthly housing production and the National Home Price Index uh, indexed to January 2000. Housing production has been at least 10 points short of its 2000 level for more than a decade now. There hasn't been enough housing built since the recession, and that's one important element to understanding why home prices exceed 200% of their 2000 levels. Um, and that's, that was a, a mark that we hit earlier this year in 2019. To round out this picture of wages and housing costs, the Joint Center for Housing Study publishes every year the median home price to median income ratio for metropolitan areas around the country. This ratio expresses relative affordability, generally the lower ratio 
the better likelihood that housing is both affordable and attainable to people live in, living in a given metro area. Overall, the U.S. has become more expensive. So in, that, um, in the black shaded areas, you can see that um, we went in this ratio from about three to four points, which means that um, in 2018, it would take four times a person's, or a cost of housing was about four times their uh, annual salary or income. Um, but that growth has been driven almost entirely by metropolitan areas, exemplified by Los Angeles and San Francisco, but also increasingly uh, Boulder, Denver, Greeley is now on the list, um, is now in the top 100. Um, and uh, in fact, according to JCHS, Western states are home to the 20 metro areas that experienced the highest increases in median home price to home household income ratio between 1990 and 2018. So to kind of um, wrap, wrap up my presentation, um, there's some really great, uh, there's a really great research brief from Pew Research Center last year that looked at, at data for 2017. And they found that in 2017, nearly 79 million adults, almost one in three adults in the United States, lived in a doubled up household. Discounting the primary heads of household, their partners, spouses, and children enrolled in college, there were 40 million what they call extra adults living in households for which they were not the head. Of those 40 million, nearly half were children of the head of the household. It was also twice as common in 2017 than in 1995 for parents to have moved in with their adult children, but less likely for the extra adult in a household to be a housemate or a roommate. Um, so those are some of, just some of the basic, um, you know, kind of background and higher level um, ideas uh, that we're going to be kind of talking about today. And um, before we turn, kick things off with Jennifer and Phyllis, I do have another poll for you. Um, and this one asks um, just kind of where your community is when thinking about the issue. Um, if, your, if your community has tackled the issue, uh, this is a side note, if your community has tackled this issue, please just leave a comment in the chat box or the question box because we'd love to highlight uh, the work that everybody has been able to do on this front. <coughs> so we will give another 30, uh, let's give a little bit less than that, let's give another 15 seconds before we turn it over. So I will close out that poll and share it back with everybody. Um, so it looks like most people are, um, you know, either in the not uh, local concern, not sure where to start, or staff is monitoring or assessing the issue. Um, and you know, especially those folks who are located uh, in in the Denver region in Colorado, um, we hope that this can, you know, give a little bit of uh, a little bit more heft to the the research that you have going on, or help you uh, start out um, if you're looking into this issue. So, um, up next, we have Jennifer Newcomer and Phyllis Resnick. Jennifer leads the efforts of SHIFT's team to transform data into actionable information. Her research focuses on social and built environment related issues, particularly those impacting family economic well being. Jennifer is also a former Dr. Cogger, I have to mention that in our office, and she holds a master in urban and regional planning from the University of Colorado Denver. Phyllis is the lead economist at the, Colorado, at the Colorado Futures Center at Colorado State University and an independent consultant whose practice focuses on economic forecasting, revenue and fiscal sustainability studies, and economic impact studies for state and local governments. Dr. Resnick has a master's from UC Boulder and a PhD from UC Denver. With that, I will turn it over to Jennifer Newcomer. And actually, oh, Jeff actually, is going to turn it right over to me. <laughs> All right, so Phyllis, um, kick us off. Good afternoon. I'm Phyllis Fezzik. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. It's my um, responsibility today to take you through the odyssey that got us to the point where we started studying doubling up, and then I will turn it over to Jennifer to take you through what we've found so far. 
And then the two of us will likely tag team for the end with Jennifer at the lead. So quickly, what drove us to the point where we got interested in doubling up? Um, our exploration started about four or five years ago when we did a local study for Adams County, actually for Housing Colorado, focused on Adams County in Colorado. And we were interested in this issue about why everyone should care about housing affordability. And one argument we were making is that housing affordability affects not only those who are most directly um, challenged by the affordability problem, but it actually also affects everyone in the community. And one of the metrics we looked at was what is the impact of the amount of spending that could be going to other activities. Now, these could be food, these could be clothing, these could be recreation, this could be healthcare, this could be daycare, transportation, anything that would be in a household budget that is being foregone because we have households that are challenged from a housing cost perspective. And we found um, statewide that if you looked at the housing stress population, and we um, looked at only those who are in the $50,000 a year or less income demographic, that the foregone spending back um, when we did this study for Colorado was $2 billion. What that meant was um, that these households which are spending um, an additional $2 billion to support their housing are not spending that money supporting local businesses, supporting the tax base, and supporting other activities in the community. So that led us into an exploration of, well, what's really driving the affordability problem in Colorado? We um, affectionately refer to this graphic as the wheel of despair. It is um, the lead graphic from a study that is also on the, the SHIFT website looking at the factors impacting housing affordability in the metro region and statewide. And this grew out of our contention that um, we here in Colorado were sort of missing the big picture. We were very quick to blame things like construction defect legislation or one other maybe low-hanging fruit, but really that it was a mosaic of impacts that were causing our affordability problem. Um, if you go to this study on the website, you'll find a little sort of pull-out sheet on each one of the, um, of the areas that are in the small circles around the wheel. But what I want to focus on today is that more than anything else, housing is a market like anything else, and so it's impacted by supply and demand. And so we went back and we looked at what had happened to supply and demand in the region um, since the year 2001. And let me kind of define what's going on here a little bit. What we found was that um, we have this kind of crazy term here in the legend called housing seekers. We looked at the household forecasts and history from our state demographer's office, and we used some, some um, analytics to tease out what we thought were households that potentially might like to demand their own unit if there were a unit available for them. Um, this grows out of the notion that the Census Bureau defines a household as all the sort of individual people or family units living together under one roof. So therefore, there cannot be a true excess of what we call kind of housing seekers to housing units. You can't have negative vacancy rates. But we kind of had a suspicion because of what was going on in the market that there was this hidden issue around the fact that people were living in situations that if there were a unit that was appropriate for them, they would in fact move into that unit. So we looked at both the history and then um, a forecast that's now of a vintage about two or three years old, which we will update in the next um, iteration of this work to look at um, what are surplus of housing units or as you move forward in that graph our deficit of housing units so those those aqua colored bars show you the the surplus of housing units over what we defined as those housing seekers and then we overlaid that with a permit forecast out to the year 2025 we assumed that 100 percent of all those permits would ultimately be realized and what we had is around the year 2014 we went from a surplus of housing units to a deficit of housing units that persists in our forecast all the way out to the year 2025. what that means if we're right about this notion of housing seekers 
is that we don't have enough housing units and we're not projected to, to house everyone who would otherwise like to have their own unit. So tuck that in the back of your head. That was sort of our first clue that there was something going on with more and more people living in doubled up situations. We then went and redid that study around that $2 billion in foregone spending. And what we found is over time that that number of foregone spending has remained constant, but the number of housing units that are defined as cost burden actually declined from 2006 to 2017. So again, we looked at housing units that had um, household income of $50,000 or less, and we looked at how many of them were spending more than 30% on their housing, and we found that that declined from about 530,000 in 2006 to about 495,000 in 2017. That was our second kind of hint that what was going on is more and more of those households had more earners in them, which meant that there were likely to be more and more people doubled up in those housing units. So we took those two sort of pieces of evidence together and Jen and I thought it's time to dig into this notion of what's happening with this doubled up so we could turn our hypothesis into some more hard facts. And so with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer to take you through what we have found so far. Great. Thanks for taking that, Phil. And, you know, thinking about um, first and foremost, there's this rationale with most of the data, is, I'm sure many who are listening in today can appreciate we don't have actual questions in most of our um, survey instruments that get into the why um, of the conditions that people are actually housed within and so you know we don't we don't actually know um, those decisions that are behind um, the reality and their their housing household formation so you can imagine that um, as Kevin had mentioned earlier about, you know, like newly formed households, but they tend to, when they're early, in those early stage um, stages of their career, um, you know, there's the classic roommate uh, arrangements so that folks can actually split expenses as you start to earn more money, before you start to earn more money. You know, there's a cultural dynamic, um, and depending on certain communities, it absolutely is the norm for them, and that's their preference um, for there to be multiple generations in the household. Um, and then on the, you know, on the aging side of things, as we're seeing the boomers um, age, and that that dynamic become more prevalent in many communities. That is, uh, especially in allowing um, folks to age in place that other family members might come in and help care for them. And so there's that care on the elderly side, um, as well as actually the on, on the early childhood side, to the extent that um, you think about a household budget and the expense of housing tends to rank highest in terms of percentages of expenses. But if there's a, especially a young child, um, childcare expenses can come a close second or actually um, actually um, exceed the percentage share of what otherwise is going to housing. Um, and then I think the one that we're really curious about in terms of um, the rationale and to what extent this is um, a growing phenomenon is around the, the extension of all these economic pressures that um, surpass generations and, um, and are really uh, they're really couched within the, the challenges as it relates to the housing market and those um, those price pressures that we've um, we've been talking about so greatly. Um, real quickly, we we wanted to make sure we were very clear. Well, you know, the census we didn't effectively go far beyond the Census Bureau's definitions, but just so that we were very clear in what we had assembled in our analysis um, in terms of how we have defined a doubled up family household versus a doubled up non-family household. Um, all of this content is available in the brief that we're pushing out publicly later and will be available on our website. Um, but I think the, the universal um, distinction is that, that you have these multiple um, individuals or group of individuals that could be living together that might otherwise decide 
to have their own housing unit should they have other choices available to them. Um, and these are the numbers that we ran um, and came up with, for, and these are statewide numbers. Uh, we don't have specific cutouts for the Denver metro region, um, but we do have them defined at the Puma level um, should subsequent cuts um, be interested, you know, that folks would be interested in seeing those. But statewide, we're looking at about 560,000 households that are estimated in 2017. 2017 to fit these um, doubled up definitions. And we've broken them out by the family versus non-family. So significantly more, obviously, in the, um, the family situation versus the non-family situation. Um, who, who are these folks um, in terms of what is their tenure uh, situation relative to, to the cuts on the family versus non-family, but um, those owners still tend to be um, the dominant share, but the the renters, there's there's still almost 40% um, are in a renter situation. And when we get down a little bit further, we'll talk about some of the conditions that um, might be a little bit more precarious for some households that are doubled up, especially when they're in a renter situation. Um, we also looked at the, the age demographics and um, when we looked and we were we were curious around those who are minors and especially the youngest um, of the young, those kids um, age birth to five, um, as well as those who are aging and this sort of dynamic that's happening on the, the ends of the, the age cohorts where we see essentially about one in five of those respective cohorts um, being doubled up, being exposed in a doubled up situation. And um, we can talk in a minute about um, the kind of crossover there. But but when you think about all of minors, um, we thought some of the findings in particular to the young kids um, were the most striking that we weren't necessarily anticipating um, and seeing that about 25% of our minors in, in the state are in some sort of doubled up arrangement. Um, of course, then the other cuts that looked at uh, the dynamic of those kids who are under the age um, five and under that they, uh, you know, how many are exposed when they have a single parent, uh, especially and that the majority of those who are um, are in a, a doubled up situation for those under five are, are dominantly with single parents. Um, so those were all the, the most current numbers, but we were really curious about, as Phil's teed it up, that, that is this really an increasing phenomenon? We've heard it very much so anecdotally to a lot, from a lot of our partners who are working in community and, you know, and the, essentially the kinds of um, solutions that folks are are finding to be able to be able to get by and participate and being a, being a resident in, in this region and in this state. And what we did find from from our analysis was that looking prior to the Great Recession and couched in 2006, is that we we saw a significant increase in those households who are in a doubled up situation. Um, when you compare that to the overall household growth in the state. So, um, whereas in 2006, about 20% of the households were um, defined as doubled up, whereas now it's about 25%. Um, and then those are the, the actual figures uh, growing to from around 415,000 households in 2006 to uh, about 560,000 now, or most recently in 17. Um, so the growth rates, when you think about the family households doubled up versus the non-family, remember the, the family households um, are more than twice as common um, than the non-family. So the growth rate is going to be a little bit more significant when we are looking at a smaller denominator, but um, still pretty striking in terms of the growth within those relationships, um, about 30% and then about 41%. Um, and that the increase in the average household size has persisted 
um, in the doubled up um, in particular. So more people now on average in those doubled up than we even saw prior. Um, and then this, this was probably our top level uh, aha from the work. We did not expect this particular finding, but thinking about those households who are doubled up versus those that are not, um, those that are not who had a child under the age of six actually declined. The absolute number of kids are fewer than prior to the, than prior in 2006. Whereas we saw about a 25% increase in those um, doubled up households who have kids under the age of six. When you look at the um, total growth in the kids, uh, in all minors and the kids under 18, almost 90% of the growth in those kids in the population were attributed to um, the doubled up households. So pretty significant, um, I think, finding there that we were not expecting and that actually has raised, I think with any <laughs> good inquiry, we ended up with a lot more questions um, than these, these first rounds of findings um, to really unearth what is the dynamic that's, that's potentially driving there. We also looked at the relationship here um, as it relates to the, the head. This was defined based off of the head of household who was answering the survey um, and that, the, that that share of, of total households by generation, how they have, have moved over time. So, you know, you can see how millennials have been maturing and forming their own households. So, you know, fewer situations where they're doubling up now than prior in 2006. Whereas in the Gen X generation, you can see there's been a, a pretty big lift in terms of um, how many are doubled up now. And so some of that we anticipate is um, actually being influenced by just the, the aging population overall and how um, the Gen X looking with younger kids and having an older parent, having a parent present or, or what have you is, is really a dynamic that's playing out um, in that, that particular growth. Um, so thinking back, um, as Phyllis had mentioned before too, is thinking more holistically about what are the real drivers that are influencing folks to double up? Um, and when you think about um, this is the most recent breakout that comes from the, the self-sufficiency standard that's developed um, every couple of years um, for the state of Colorado. It's believed that it is a more holistic and realistic accounting of what it takes, takes to get by economically without any public or private supports. Um, it's way more comprehensive than you can imagine that the federal poverty measure is that doesn't account for true cost um, increase in the whole kind of household uh, basket of expenses. And so here, this is looking specifically at a one adult, one infant household, uh, happens to be specifically for Adams County, um, whereas it, housing is now in 2018, which is the most recent report, uh, it takes about 29% of that household budget to accommodate housing. If you have a child, and, and in particular infant is pretty, is the most expensive, but if you have a child and expect them to be in childcare, it is almost 27% of the household's income. So, you know, thinking about what it takes to get by and the realistic expenses that a household is facing now, um, you know, there are very real pressures to, to be able to figure out where there is housing um, because that housing um, relationship there, that housing expense relationship right there is, is we, would, we would argue is actually pretty um, conservative, I guess, <laughs> um, because that's only a $1,350 a month payment off of that income. And so, um, and then if you expect them to, to pay for childcare in addition to that, I mean, it's people are having to make um, really specific decisions to be able to figure out how to get by economically. Um, we looked at the, again, we looked at the statewide, but we have everything kind of at the PUMA level. Um, 
And so this was just a view for art as well as our gut check um, to see how those kind of patterns of um, doubling up were really playing out across the state. Um, as you can see, as it gets a little darker, it's a higher percentage of the share of um, doubled up to all of households. And um, more discreetly, if you're within the Denver region, this is how it's playing out um, with a little bit of a zoomed in. You can kind of see Boulder up in the northwest portion there that's dark. And of course, a lot of that is um, attributed to a lot of the student population that um, is obviously has to get creative sometimes up there. Um, but we do see the highest concentration, at least in the, the metro area, is that area just east of Denver that's in, at, in, that's in the split between Adams and Arapahoe County that's in predominantly um, Aurora, where we see that highest share. That is also um, an area that we know is, a, is the target landing zone for refugee populations um, and where we've heard a lot of anecdotes around creative solutions that um, households are, are going to, to to be able to get, get, get by and have a roof over their head. So, that's, that's the essence, and we wanted to just make sure that we got um, this first set of findings because we knew that there was a lot of these conversations have, being had right now, and knowing that we actually have a lot more that we want to look into, we wanted to at least get some information put out. That's why we split this um, report up um, into two parts. And so to give you a flavor of what we anticipate coming for part two, and I'll just throw it out there, as um, Kevin mentioned earlier, please um, please toss out ideas that um, might come to mind, um, who's, who's on the webinar today, that is something that's pertinent um, to, to situations that's go that are going on in your community that are worth us considering looking into because all the work that we do, especially the work that Phyllis and I do together, is we want it to be really responsive to what is the, the most current topic du jour that's happening in communities that's going to be relevant so that our work is, is, is actually um, taken into action. So um, before that, um, we want to just couch again, and Phil started off with it earlier, is that this is fundamentally not just a situational context that implicates the households that are experiencing any sort of vulnerable, especially from the standpoint of those who are, are, are vulnerable in their, in their housing situation. Um, it has far reaching effects that you know, go beyond the economic and the fiscal ones that we've otherwise um, quantified in past work. But there are very real um, implications for the health of the community, the health of the, the residents, but also um, the broader community. And from the standpoint of education, if you think about the vulnerability of especially kids who are in non-stable situations housing-wise, um, you know, the, the vulnerability and the mobility of some of our students um, in our um, schools now is not just implicating those kids who are moving in and out, it absolutely implicates the kids who are left in that classroom, and it implicates the teacher in that classroom because of the uneven dynamic and the, and the, the unstable um, aspects of that classroom. And so um, we just want to make sure that while we're not specifically um, reporting on those things like the education outcomes, um, we want to make sure that it's at least acknowledged and, and present in the conversation and, and folks are aware that it, it has far reaching effects on everybody. Um, so for part two, we're, we're interested in diving in further about what does this mean then? You know, we've seen that it's been a growing phenomenon, but you know, what? so is it just because there's a lot of grandparents living with their kids or vice versa? Um, but is it really a function, of, to what extent is it at a function of an economic stress, whether it's specifically housing or if it's specifically childcare in some of those, in some of those situations, we won't know, we don't know that degree of detail, but we will be testing as it relates to economic stress. Um, and therefore, if we simulate um, essentially breaking up these households, to what degree 
could those how those then unique new households actually afford the median price home in this market? Um, and then we we intend to roll in some work that we've been doing over the years and are working on an update now on the relationship to the self-sufficiency standard and the occupational structure that uh, we have in our state and in our metro that could actually um, support um, a stable housing situation. And related to the affordability piece, if we were to, um, you know, if we think about the simulation of breaking up these households, to what extent are we seeing there to be potential real demand that is being masked now um, because of the doubling up phenomenon? Um, and what does that ultimately lead into from a policy standpoint around things like how the HUD income limits are um, composed? Those are crafted off of the, uh, the family median income. And when we see more and more families doubled up, theoretically, we would be art conceivably artificially raising that um, median family income and therefore potentially artificially qualifying more and more people for subsidized housing support that may or may not be um, who those who those folks were necessarily intended to be supported with that, that kind of policy. Um, and so how does that potentially create a kind of hyper competitive pool of resources um, for those who are really, truly um, in most need? So um, with that, um, we were happy to res try to start responding to questions um, yeah. um, or what it, and um, if there's anything yeah. else that we wanted to wrap up on our end. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll move, we'll move into questions. Um, there are a couple right now. So one is, um, in looking at your numbers at all, how do they account for those kind of multi-generational preferences, if you have any information on, on like other, um, there, if it's like cultural preferences or, you know, if there's, if you did a breakdown by, by race or anything like that with some of these figures. Yeah, we do have, the segmentation um, for each of the individuals based off of their race and their and their ethnicity, and so I think we would want to, you know, before we start to infer <laughs> on our own accord what those are likely to be um, cultural preferences, I think we would um, we would need to do some ethnography and, and validation around some comfort levels of how we would. Define that to, to place those flags um, but we do we did um, when we pulled all the survey data we did pull um, the racial and ethnic um, variables on those, on those individuals in the household so it's possible we would need more informant um, that would be driven by um, a variety of cultural bases that, uh, that make that decision that are core to their decision making if that makes sense and to the first point in that question, um, we do know, and we'll dig in further to essentially who the doubled up party is. So we know, is it a grandmother? Is it an adult child who has moved back home for a few years to get their career going? Um, and as Jen alluded to, our plan is to tackle the issue of taking all those doubled up households and splitting them to see um, you know, what the economic conditions would be of those separated households. And so at that point, when we undertake that exercise, we'll go to look at that generational issue. How many of them really are grandparents? Um, this morning we were speaking with someone and I said, you know, if we look at someone or one of these households and the doubled up party is a 90 year old grandparent, we're unlikely to split that one and say, oh, that 90 year old grandmother or grandfather is likely to go off and get his or her own apartment. So we are gonna take that more detailed look. We just haven't gotten the chance to dig into that yet. And once we do that, you know, we can overlay that a little bit with some of the other data we have to try and get a better sense. We'll never know for sure though, because you know, as we led with, we don't ask that question, why are you living like this? So, um, you know, we're gonna have to sort of infer from what we can 
you know, tell from what we do know about these homes. Um, for Metro Denver specifically, I don't know uh, how much you drill down to specific locations, but um, how much of the growth have you, I don't, and I don't know if you've run this, but how much of the growth um, do you think comes from the lack of housing stock versus um, it's part of the housing affordability challenge? Um, how much of it is due to, yeah, I guess, that preferences versus just general cost of limited housing stock? Uh, I mean, we haven't run specific summary numbers for the region, uh, but we can certainly, I, I think we we would expect to do that. I mean, obviously the region kind of sucks the air out of the state, right? Um, in terms of the, <laughs> the largest share. Um, but, but yeah, I think that that is something that, like uh, Phyllis mentioned earlier, we will be updating that forecast um, that she walked me through at the beginning. Um, because, you know, we've seen recently, right? We've seen some recent media releases that seems to be in certain segments. We might be catching up a little bit in terms of housing production. I mean, I think the jury's still out on that. I mean, it's like, you know, whatever might catch the, the headline at the time. But um, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll look at that again and, and look at this sort of dynamic and the relationship on, in terms of what kind of housing stock we've really brought to the market um, and and see what that relationship looks like as it relates to the doubling up households economic profile as well. Um, so this I was this question was triggered during the slide talking about um, education, but uh, for for school districts, um, I know that Shift has done some work with Denver Public Schools, uh, but. Do school districts know a whole lot about, you know, what, what does this mean for school districts that kids are going to be increasingly coming from, from double up households? I'm thinking things as basic, you know, permission slips that you can go home with an uncle, um, all the way up to actually getting better instruction and instruction that um, <clears throat> makes sense. So, you know, what kind of implications are there out of this for school districts to be thinking? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think we've had a lot of conversations with our colleagues at the at the school districts, um, especially um, DPS. And we did that forecast together with a former Dr. Cog colleague um, a couple of years ago. And um, and our, you know, there's there's some data that comes out from some uh, some conversations we've had with core public schools and in terms of the turnover um, that is, is happening in some of the schools. You don't necessarily see it um, at the school, like the total enrollment level, the data that would actually be reported through, say, the district or the state. Um, but in some, you know, some passing conversations, as we're talking about this, this dynamic, especially I think there's, there's huge implications, what you mentioned, Kevin, particularly as it relates to kids who are in, in renter situations and, and potentially in non-family doubled up situations where they might be particularly vulnerable if that, if, if they're in the second, if you would think about it, if they were in the secondary position and the, in the, you know, the composition and they're not directly on a lease, they're very vulnerable. I mean, and we, this conversation that Phyllis and I had this morning was couched in like a form of homelessness. And yeah, what does it mean from the standpoint of the vulnerability and their their ability to stay in place and keep that kid stable in the same school? Um, but it was a couple of years ago, the, the APS related data was, we, we kind of ran the numbers on the back of an envelope on the fly and they were essentially um, experiencing a kid enrolling or unenrolling in their district like every seven minutes on average for the year. <clears throat> if you think about like the kids who remain again, like I was mentioning before, that's enormously disruptive in the classroom. And you know, and what can you do? It, school districts, this is totally in their line of sight. Um, from everybody we've spoken to, and 
trying to figure out school districts have fundamentally got to be part of the planning process and the pathway of development and redevelopment in communities. If the community expects it to support all kinds of families and relationships, especially having kids in the community. And so I, I would just suggest that there needs to be a stronger coupling within the planning process and the school district planning process to make sure they're in the best position to be able to support that community overall. Yeah, that's great. Um, similar, you know, a similar kind of vein from school districts is that um, in a lot of this analysis, it looks like caregiving is probably going to be some sort of, it's going to be in the data somewhere implicitly, if not explicitly. Um, I was just wondering if, if either of you could potentially speak to the caregiving economy, especially as it intersects doubling up, what are some of the kind of challenges of um, a, a caregiver, whether that's an older adult taking care of their, their child versus uh, their, their adult child versus uh, you know, a, potentially one of the Gen Xers taking care of their older adult, uh, older adult family member. Um, again, it, it's, you know, I think that there's an opportunity in the data to try and tease that out, again, because the question's not there, you know, why are you living in a multi-generational setting? But I, um, I would certainly think that as the baby boom generation ages, we're going to see a lot more of this type of situation where an older parent is living with the nuclear family. Um, it's possible also that, as Jen alluded to, um, there is a situation where the grandparent or you know some other relative is providing some childcare within the household. Um, you know, we're going to have to think through how to tease that out. I think one way we could potentially tease it out is through some of the income profile of each of the members of the household. We might be able to better understand if some of that is going on. I'm not sure that there's anything in the data that will, again, be able to tell us definitively. But we're going to do our best to, you know, to come up with a methodology to, to infer um, a motive for that doubling up as we go through this exercise of trying to understand how many potentially unique households are living in a doubled up situation under one roof. Great. Um, there's one, there's a, a question here um, about housing size and new account. I can, I did a little bit of research but I can answer this. So the question is, do you take housing size into account Generally, housing uh, houses themselves have gotten larger every decade. Um, so, is there a sense that people are, you know, renting out rooms because they have extra space, or providing that as kind of a benefit to family members? Um, the stuff that I looked at right in the aftermath of the recession, part of that Census Bureau report, found that 70% of all households doubled up in the United States were single-family detached housing units, and um, there is a lot at play there. You could go down an Arthur C. Nelson rabbit hole and that sort of stuff too, where you know if, if there is less demand for large lot single family homes in suburban areas, those could increasingly become affordable to people who combine incomes. So I'm just wondering if there's, um, it, you know, if you could talk to that, uh, that dynamic. Is there a sense that people are renting out rooms because they have extra space? Yeah. I mean, and do you want to talk to you about? I think the, the whole homestead exemption and the influence for yeah. Yeah. the aging population is the same. But I mean, there's the swirling more yeah. <laughs> yeah. of things, right? It's yeah. truly wicked yeah. problems with yeah. the vortex of yeah. the vortex of yeah. 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 I mean, I think there's no doubt. We've seen some national stories also. I think there was a very prominent one. Was it, it was a Q, it was, was it Zillow or no, one, of the, one of the housing groups? was able to mine their data and find that there was like an increasing prevalence of say married couples, young married couples who were taking on a border. And um, having a larger house would certainly facilitate that, right? If you have a one bedroom house and you're a married couple, you're less likely to take on a border, right? If you have a couple of empty bedrooms, 
that aren't doing anything, you know, all of a sudden you start to see a revenue opportunity there or an income opportunity. And so I think there's no doubt that that has probably facilitated it. But I also would go one step back and say, but would that be their preferred way to live? Or are they doing this because it's the only way they can afford to live in a house? And perhaps maybe because there is a mismatch between the housing stock that's available and those you know, households that are being put in a situation where they have to take on a border. Um, which leads us to what Jen alluded to. Um, you know, we have long ruminated on this issue of the um, old age homestead exemption that we have in Colorado that um, in order to qualify for it, you have to age qualify and you also have to tenure qualify, meaning that you have to be age eligible and have lived in your home, I think, for 10 years. And so there's starting to be some anecdotal evidence that we'd also like to dig into that, and don't take this the wrong way when I say this, I don't mean it literally, but we're trapping older people in homes that maybe they would turn over if they weren't um, you know, trying to hold on to that credit. And so, you know, maybe that's a good thing. So they have a home, it has an extra room, it provides companionship, it provides some income, but it also may be keeping people in homes that they don't necessarily want to be in that are a little too much for them to negotiate. And so, um, you know, again, this is going to be a very, very multifaceted sort of second phase of this evaluation. And we're, we're going to have to dig in and see what we can overlay on each other and, and learn as we look more deeply at trying to discern motive for what's happening. I, I, my, um, how about this? My thought going into that is that economic distress is, is certainly going to be part of the story. It's hard to believe with what's going on in this region and with the time frame over which this phenomena has grown, that economic, economic distress is completely not culpable in why we're seeing an increase in this phenomena. The issue is to what extent is it economic distress and to what extent is it some of these other phenomena that we've been talking about for the last few minutes. Um, so we've got about three minutes left. Um, I do want to, uh, there's a couple ending announcements that I'd like to get to. But there's one last question. Um, interesting question, the, the woulds and shoulds kind of question. So would you think less single family zoning would compel more housing stock to be generated? Um, are there other sorts of potential planning tools in the toolbox that we could uh, potentially uh, employ to get more housing built? Your sandbox. <laughs> so loaded. Come on, last one. Last <laughs> one. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the Denver region and um, the state has obviously, you know, we, we have the continued, you know, we're going to persist, I think, to just be this very attractive market for a lot of folks to come to. And, um, you know, historically, it's been the area where everybody wants their elbow room uh, in the West, and therefore, we have all this wide open space, and I will forever argue that, like, our problems are not necessarily parallel to these coastal markets who have historically had these housing price pressures, and what can we learn? Because they're not dredging land on their coastline to be able to create more land. I mean, we have land here, um, and that's not, I'm saying that in the, in the and absolutely the upper center of planning and smart growth needs and the whole bit, right? Um, but I think there is um, there, there's this there's this challenge, right, in terms of the relationship between the market and its understanding of what consumer preference really is. And you know, again, I'll put the plug for our housing study that Bill's um, teed up at the beginning. Um, that's tricky because again, you're talking about preference, preference to double up, the preference of what kind of housing do you want, like all of it. And we would argue because of the current situation in the market that we actually continue to build either high A, high end luxury rental, multifamily, or pretty high end single family. 
but there's enough demand pressure in the system, it's creating the feedback loop to the market that said, well, you know, we're one buyer for that 4,000 odd square foot house, single family out in the burbs. Um, you know, they dropped off, but guess what? They have like 18 behind them that are fulfilling the demand to continue building that. Um, I think those pressures have probably abated a little bit recently, but I think there needs to be some hard thinking about the focus around what type of housing people are willing and interested to obtain. And I think to put, put the piece, and this is not an area that we really explore, Phyllis and I talk about it just in our free time, um, but what is the intersection as it relates to climate vulnerability in this market? And what is the what is the rational behavior that exists as it relates to, I mean, I'm sorry, even with double up households, who is paying for heating and cooling, probably in the future more cooling of the 4,000 square foot house? Um, so I would, I would continue to try to skirt that question <laughs> from the standpoint yeah. of, I think, um, I think we need to learn a lot more about the consumer preference, especially as we continue to um, import talent into the state and into this market and, and test those boundaries a little bit and, and not just because we're selling the product means we should build more, build more of it. Because really the reason, because we're you know, building more of that product is because that's all the product that is available. So people have to live somewhere, and I'll be it if they're doubled up or not. Thank you both so, so much for your presentation today. Um, I do just want to uh, well, we'll go toward the end, all the way back through the presentation. Uh, there is an IAP2 training at Dr. Cog um, later this month. Um, up to 30 CM credits are available for uh, if you want that through AICP. Um, that link is available in the handouts pane. Um, shifts report the, the handout. I see it with my eyes here, um, but you can see it too. It's available in the handouts pane, um, and, and you're releasing it publicly today. And it'll be available on our website. And it'll be available on Shifts website as well. Um, last note is that our idea exchange series continues on. We are official with an event on September 5th to look into the outdoor environment and, um, and the economic well-being. And then we have a webinar scheduled for September 24th about multimodal mobility featuring the active transportation plan for the region that um, came out of Dr. Cog, as well as the first and last mile strategic plan from RTD uh, with an October uh, to be determined date for another one um, with APA Colorado featuring their award winner from the first ever Great Places in Colorado award. So with that, um, I'll close out the session. Thank you all so much for attending today, and hopefully this stimulated some interesting thought and ideas. And let us know if you have any other questions. Thanks, and have a great day. <laughs>